thank you, Barb, for that beautiful version of, um, what was it, Christ whose glory fills the skies. Yeah, so um, we welcome you to worship with us at New Call United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Pam Harkema. I also serve at Liberty Pole and at Retreat. And we are glad that you are joining us online today. Um, as you worship, if you'd like to go to our website, driftlessministry.org, and download the bulletin so you can follow along with our worship. Also, there's Sunday School on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Christine Harrington's just been doing a wonderful job and is exploring prayer with the kids. So, uh, good for kids and good for grown-ups, too. Um, Tuesday at Liberty Pole, we will have our board meeting at 6.30, and then there's the Wednesday Bible study with Bob. And then we are also getting ready for our drive-up church experience on the 14th of February. So we are looking for everyone who is a member of our churches to drive to church during the regular worship time. Uh, we have a Lenten gift bag for you that has many tools that will help you to enrich your Lenten experience and your Lenten journey. So we, we would ask that you would come during the regular worship time for your church. And if you're not going to be able to come to your church at your time, let me know and I'll have your bag at, at a, wherever you want to come. So um, with that, I think that we will ask Debbie Groves to lead us in our reading of the collective. Good morning. God is good all, all the time. time. And all the time, God, God is good. good. Let's center our thoughts this morning. The Lord teaches and we hear amazing lessons. Christ speaks and we discover wisdom. In the Holy Spirit, we are called to learn to teach and to praise. And may we sing together over oh, a thousand times to sing. Faithfully, 
in the blessed name of Christ our Savior. Amen. This morning we have a couple of joys, a couple of concerns, and obviously we have many to pray for. So I want to first lift Gloria Warmuth from the New Hope Church. She had her cancer surgery on Wednesday, and so far things are looking pretty good. So we are, uh, her surgery went well, and she is back home, so we are very grateful to the healing ministry of the people who have been caring for Gloria, for Sarah, who's been taking care of her every day. Um, we want to lift the family of Philip Hickok, who passed this week, and um, he will be cremated, and we will have an interment ceremony for him at Walnut Mound um, in, later in the spring. Um, Jeff Matson continues to do well at home, and um, we're so thankful that he is finally out of the hospital, so that those are all good, good things. So many people who have COVID, um, we're we're lifting praise. I know a number of people are getting vaccines for the COVID virus, so that we're excited about that rollout beginning here in, in our area, and we, we are so grateful for all the medical professionals who are making that possible. Um, I am especially praying for our churches as we, we march towards our Lenten season, that we um, develop that spirit of self-reflection. Self that we can understand our place in, in the great scheme of God's ministry. And we, we call that self-awareness, that, that we know that we have something to contribute and we have something to learn from God's ministry. And that is what I like to think of as Lent, is our, our own self-reflection. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God of all creation, we are so grateful for the opportunity to worship you. That you want us to come before you. That you want us to adore you. And not because you are in need of our adoring, but Lord, that we need to understand what it means to be connected with you. So God, today we open our hearts, we open our ears, and we open our minds to hear what you have to say to us, to listen for your word, and how it applies to our life. We hear the names of people we care about, people who are sick and people who are homebound, people who have had surgeries. And God, in all of these difficult times and these difficult circumstances, we know how very present you are for Gloria and for Jeff, for Marla, for the family of Philip. God, we ask your continued presence for us. And in places and situations where there is discord, Lord, we ask your peace would reign. Help us to connect with people in many ways. We know that every day, Lord, there is someone in our life who we are supposed to interact with. That you have a message for them or they have a mess, you have a message for us through them. So Lord, open us to see and let us be used in that way. 
and the many blessings, Lord, that you continue to heap on us, we give you thanks. And we lift our voices together in the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. So I want to ask the kids how it is that, how do they communicate with their parents? How do you talk to your parents? How do you to, uh, express yourself to your parents? And sometimes, um, I know my grandson, when he wants attention from my, his mom, he, he yells, he screams. That's how he gets his attention and that's how his mom knows that he needs something, he wants something. Um, they used to say the squeaky wheel gets the grease, okay? That just means that you don't, you don't give attention to something that doesn't ask for it. So um, in this, in this uh, picture that we have here, this mom is talking to her daughter and is trying to talk to her daughter very calmly and so forth. But sometimes that daughter doesn't look like she's really listening very much. Now, the way that we learn in school is that the teacher tells us something or shows us something or, um, or has us do something and then we, we absorb it, we learn it, we, we can see it, we can understand it when we do it, we, we hear the words, the, the words become familiar. And, and so learning is really an exercise in listening and doing and um, participating and so when I think about us in worship you know a lot of people just come to worship and they say okay I check off like I've, I've marked my time on worship but unless we listen and learn something from worship and unless then we do something with worship we really haven't learned anything at all so when we learning is a two-way street now, the other thing about this picture is that the little girl has some things that she could probably teach her mom. Mom has to be ready to listen, too. Sometimes we think we're pretty smart and we don't have anything to learn, but we all have things that we need to learn. And God puts us with people who can teach us. See, that's just a miracle. You know, that's just a, that's just a God miracle. So I hope that when your mom and dad talk to you, you can listen and you can try to understand, and if you don't understand what they're saying, you can ask questions and see if you can get them to show you what they mean so that you can both learn something. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer. God, thank you for teaching us always and teaching us in ways that we don't expect. I ask your blessing on every person, every child, young and old, who are listening today so that we can all be learners of God. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue worship with a, a song called Silence Frenzied Unclean Spirit. I don't think we've ever sung this song, and honestly, the music to this song is, is well, Barb and I decided it's just awful. So there's another tune that works with it, and it's the one that um, uh, God has spoken through the prophets. It, you'll recognize it anyway. It's kind of a, it's got some pep. So, um, Barb, if you lead us in that.
The Gospel reading this morning is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and obey, they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So scholars tell us that the first acknowledged miracle of Jesus is the transforming of water into wine at the wedding that took place at Cana. And that miracle is only recorded in the Gospel of John, and it recounts a conversation between Jesus and his mother. And that establishes that first event, or that event as the first public miracle. But the miracle recorded in Mark that Debbie read for us today is the exorcism at the synagogue, and that's the first miracle we find in, in Mark. Although, yes, we saw the heavens open up when Jesus was baptized, and yes, there was a miracle in the hearts of the disciples when they were called, but so perhaps it matters how we define what a miracle is. But Mark's short gospel identifies this event in Capernaum as the launching of Jesus' ministry. If you have a message to deliver from God, the natural place to go is to bring that message to the church where God's people meet. And this picture is the remnants of the Capernaum Synagogue, where I, and I visited this place in 2017. Very cool. Although this one that is there now is was the one that was built in the 4th century. It was built on top of the ruins of the synagogue that was in Jesus' day. But let's take a look at what the synagogue was actually for. See, there's a bit of difference between the synagogue in Jesus' time and today's church. The synagogue of the Jews was primarily a teaching institution, a place for prayer, for the reading and teaching of God's word. I, I would guess it would be kind of like a school. There wasn't any music or singing or sacrifice. The temple, however, that was a place for more elaborate worship and sacrifice. And there was only one temple, the one in Jerusalem. But the synagogues were the place where teaching and instruction took place. And Jesus came to the synagogue to bring a new message. When the Sabbath came, he went to the synagogue and he taught. Now, unlike today, when someone is appointed to serve as a minister or a pastor for a specific church, the synagogue did not have any specific spiritual leader. There were groups of officials who directed the service or collected offerings or distributed alms and sometimes food to the poorest people. Then another leader, we'll call him the chairman of the trustees, he was responsible for the upkeep of the building and also for removing the sacred scrolls and then returning the sacred scroll, scrolls after the service. And then that person would also blow the trumpet to be, signify that the Sabbath had arrived. And then another leader yet would, would, lead, would teach the Sunday school, or Sunday school, would teach the children, so I, it makes me think of a Sunday school teacher. But as the service began, the organizer, the ruler of that service, then would call on a competent person to give address and to lead the exposition of the Torah. The Torah being the first five books of what we have as our Bible. 
that contains the Ten Commandments and, and the law. And to the Jews, the Torah was the basis of all of their faith. The exposition of the Torah is how the laws were revealed for everyday situations and everyday learning. And the Jews diligently studied the law and then followed it to the letter. And they, they worshipped this way for centuries. And that led the Jews to having a really ritualistic and legalistic way of practicing religion instead of a personal religion. See, Jesus came to change all of that. When Jesus speaks at the synagogue in Capernaum, Mark observed that those listening were astounded because he taught as one having authority, not like the scribes. Put a pin in there. Once there were two men who recited the 23rd Psalm. One was a well-known actor. The other an old and rather unsophisticated pastor. The actor's rendering was beautiful and commanding. Everyone enjoyed hearing the rich words of the beloved psalm spoken in a clear baritone. All of the inflections and pauses were perfect. Then the old minister spoke. He stumbled a bit, and the words were broken with unnatural punctuations of silence. But when he finished, there were tears in the eyes of the listeners. Something had happened, and it was the actor who gave the interpretation I know the psalm, he said. That man knows the shepherd. That's the difference that authority makes. So when someone speaks with authority, there will be those who hear and rejoice, and there will always be those who want to resist what is said. There are always those who are invested in hearing the same old message, no matter how tired it becomes, rather than listening to hear something new and daring and challenging. The scribes who read and spoke at the synagogue always referred to other sources. They would start with, there is a teaching that. They would, they would reference other teachers or the law. But when Jesus spoke, he needed no authority other than himself. He didn't quote other teachers, and he didn't quote the law. He spoke with the voice of God. Jesus' authority was recognized that day by the listeners, although the people didn't immediately reconnect him that Jesus is God. The recognition of Jesus' true nature came from the dark spirit in the man. The essence of evil knew immediately that its existence was in jeopardy. The demon knew he was in the presence of God in the Creator, in the Creator, but in human form. And the demon said, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? And that could have meant just that demon in multiple persons, or all demons. We may or may not believe that people are inhabited by evil spirits or demons today, but the people of that time actually really did. They were conscious of themselves, but they, anytime something was not right with them, they, they had the belief that there was another being in them exerting control over themselves. Clearly, a demon would cry out. They knew that Jesus would mean their end. And with one clear, brief word, Jesus acted with authority and exorcised that demon from that man. And no one had ever seen anything like that before. There wasn't any spell or formula or incantation or, my personal favorite, the procedure to drill a hole in your head, which was a common practice. 
Just, just this one sentence was needed from Christ. Come out. Come out. Jesus has that same power today. Now, I acknowledge that both light and darkness exist in everyone. And I believe for all of us, there have been times that anger or hatred or even evil in many forms has cast a long shadow on us. We believe the news, but we don't believe the Bible. We profess our belief in Christ and we worship with church, but we don't do anything to change what we are doing during the week. We encourage and allow freedoms, even freedom to publish pornography, but we restrict religion in schools. Yes, evil exists. And evil recognizes the authority of Christ. You see, there's just so much going on in this short scripture, this pericope, we call it. Jesus spoke from his own authority. Jesus acted from his own authority. And not only did the demon respond, but the people responded too. People who gathered in the synagogue that day listened to Christ's teaching. And they saw his authority in action. And they recognize with amazement that Jesus Christ is not a regular teacher. And they open their hearts and their minds to hear what was different. And they listened and they learned. That day they learned that their world had changed. And they were amazed by his teaching, by what he did. Well, we would be amazed if we were in church and we saw Jesus talking with a demon spirit. And if we saw and heard that exchange with our own ears and eyes, we'd be struck with amazement too that this Jesus could command. That Jesus could command demons and devils and they would obey his authority. And the scripture tells us Jesus' fame began to spread. Now that would only happen if the people who were there actually spread the word. They obviously told others what they had seen. They went to learn at the synagogue that day and they left with their hearts filled to overflowing and then they told others what they had learned and seen. And I think that's the exclamation point of this miracle that people told the story of the man's healing and they told of Jesus' authority. So my question for you is, do you talk about Jesus? Now, if you're participating in this worship, then Jesus has affected your life. If you're participating for the first time in worship, welcome or if you have been participating for years and years, welcome, but something brought you here today. Or maybe you're just up at 3.30 on a Tuesday morning and you landed on our channel. But maybe you went looking. Jesus found you here. You're here because of Jesus' authority. Yes, Jesus came to bring wonderful words and profound healing miracles, but Jesus first came to bring love, to forgive, and to teach us so that we might believe in him and be saved from Satan and his ways. That we would overcome everything that holds us apart from our full connection to Christ. Jesus came in authority to make us whole again, to make us holy again, so we can join him in eternal life. And Jesus has done or is doing all of that in our lives right now. And yet, we're hesitant to share the good news. We've learned, 
we have seen, we have experienced, and yet we don't feel good about teaching. And there are a couple of reasons, maybe. Maybe we think we don't have enough knowledge, we don't know much, we don't feel wise enough. Well, I like this quote from Robert Heinlein, when one teaches to learn. See, every single time I open my mouth and I talk about the Lord, I learn something. Every single time. When I share a sermon, a sermon that I have researched and written, mind you, I get a new kind of understanding, a new message from God. Does that surprise you? It, it sure surprised me. It used to even scare me. That even as I am delivering a sermon, God is whispering a new understanding. I read my sermons a few times before worship, and yep, every time, every time it happens. So if we don't think we know that much, well, we're probably right, but when we teach what we know, God uses our teaching to expand our knowledge. See, God, Christ, Holy Spirit, it has that authority. It has that ability. And then we might think, well, my story is, is my own. It's personal. It's private. Your life is the Lord's. And the details of your story are not necessary for you to teach someone else about Christ. But the victory you have today is the story to share. A lot of you know that I've had some pretty bleak chapters in my life. Times I truly did not want to live another day. Because my bad choices had caused me to lose so much of what I thought defined who I was. I was angry at myself. I was angry at others. And yeah, I was angry at God. I was discouraged, even hopeless. But Christ loved me enough to put people in my path who nudged me. Even when, and they didn't know their role. They were there doing what they were supposed to be doing, but they didn't know God put them there. And some of those people nudged me further into disgust, perhaps so I would find the bottom. And that's where I, I saw Christ and I experienced a miracle and Christ, the shepherd, was waiting for me to open my heart and took the hand of this lost sheep and led me back. So I tell you that to hopefully inspire you that no matter what darkness lives in you, Christ's authority lifts you. Whatever holds you back from learning Christ's amazing authority or whatever keeps you from sharing Christ's victory in your life, just acknowledge that. Acknowledge that burden right now. Admit that it's there and then let it go. Release your burdens in the name of Christ so that you can freely share your good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. The generosity of our churches and the people who give to our ministry allows our ministry to continue. And we thank you for giving to our churches. Please look for the addresses in the bulletin where you can send a contribution. And let us now join together as we dedicate our gifts to God. Let us pray. May the, the gifts, gifts we share be given from our hearts, from our gratitude, and, and from our faithfulness that all we give be both a blessing shared and received. Lord, we praise you in joyful thanks. Amen. And we close our worship today with You Are the Sea.
closing blessing. Let's pray. I am replenished by the grace and mercy of God. I am blessed by the healing love of Jesus. I am energized by the limitless power of the Holy Spirit. I go to learn, to teach, to tell my story, and to proclaim my faith. Every time we learn something, it is our obligation, I think, to share it, especially when it's, we learn something about our faith, and to share it by showing it, by expressing it, by giving it to another person. When Jesus came to the temple or to the synagogue that day, he came to teach, and the people came with an open heart to learn. And so I pray that you will go in peace and teach what you have learned in the love of Christ. Amen. <laughs>